This is the second recorder for chapter presentation. In the previous record, we have seen that the limit is basically a two-sided notion. However, uh, a function might, might have one-sided limits also. Let's try to see what one-sided limit is. When we write limit as x approaches to f of x l, uh, this means that the limit of a function as x approaches both from the left and from the right, uh, which is left is values less than c, right means values greater than c. So that's uh, ordinary limit. Uh, by definition, that's an ordinary limit. Now, one-sided limits are denoted like this. Limit as x approaches to c plus, which means from the right, or with values greater than c, that gives you the limit from the right. Limit as x approaches c minus of f of x. That's the left-hand limit approaching c with values less than c. Therefore, a function f of x may not have an ordinary limit, but it might, ha it might have one-sided limits. Now, let's give an example. f of x is equal to x over absolute value of x. Now, when you approach x from the right hand, when you approach 0 from the right-hand side, here, x is a positive number, delta x is a positive number, same as x. So the limit is equal to 1 for this function as you approach from the right-hand side. Now, as you approach from the left-hand side, absolute value of x is equal to minus x. So the limit is minus 1. And so this function has right and and left hand limits, but they are not equal. So it does not have an ordinary limit at x equal to zero. Uh, so for a function f of x, the right hand limits might be l and the left hand limit might be uh, m. If l is not equal to m, then the function does not have an ordinary limit. Let's continue with a pictorial representation of uh, this function. So this function is x divided by absolute value of x. And when you approach from the right-hand side, the limit is 1. Now, when you approach from the left-hand side, absolute value of x is equal to minus x. So the limit here is equal to minus 1. That's a pictorial representation. So this function does not have ordinary limit, but it has right hand and left hand limit. That's another pictorial representation of an arbitrary function. So x approaches to see from the right hand side here, and the function has a limit L shown here. That's the distance from year to year. So f of x approaches to L. Now, that's the left-hand side limits. f of x is here on the left of c. x is, has values less than c. And the limit is m. So as x approaches to c, f of x approaches to m. That shows right-hand and left-hand limits pictorially. Now let's look at the... Uh, real function, y is equal to 4 minus x squared, that's an upper semicircle with radius 2. So y is positive here, so that's positive square root. Now this function is defined in this close interval as a value for each x in the close interval minus 2 and 2. But when you approach minus 2 from the right hand side, the limit is 0. But you cannot approach minus 2 from the left hand side because the function is not defined there. Same is true uh, for this uh, 2. 
If you approach two from the left hand side, the limit is zero. You cannot approach two from the right hand side because the function is not defined there. Therefore, you have at the end points right hand and left hand uh, limits. But uh, so the function does not have ordinary limit obviously at the end points, uh, but it has one sided limits. Now the theorem uh, says uh, what we have said before. This statement, that's the ordinary limit of f of x as x approaches c is L, is true if and only if uh, as x approaches to c left hand, from left hand side and from right hand side, uh, the limit is L for this also. So this implies that one-sided limits are equal. If one-sided limits are equal, uh, it, it, applies, it means that uh, f of x has ordinary limit at x equal to c. So these are if and only if statements. Now let's look at this function. This is a piecewise defined function. The definition of the function is here. This is obviously 1 minus x. This is 1 here. And uh, uh, the function value is 2 here, which is shown by the dot. And its function value is again 2 here. And again, 1 here, uh, one here is at 4, the function value is 1 half, not equal to 1. Let's see uh, several points where this function has a limit or right-hand limit, left-hand limit. Now, the function is defined over the closed interval 0, 2. Now, if I approach 0 from the right-hand side, the function has limit 1, and it's equal to the value of the function. However, if I approach 1 from the left-hand side, the limit is 0. If you approach 1 from the right-hand side, the limit is 1. So at 1, this function has right and left-hand limits, uh, but uh, the limits, these limits are not the same. Uh, right, left-hand limit is 0, right-hand limit is 1. So it does not have an ordinary limit. Now let's look at 2. When I approach 2 from the left-hand side, the limit is 1. When I approach 2 from the right-hand side, the limit is 1 again. So at 2, the function has a limit because both right and left-hand limits are 1. So uh, this function has ordinary limit 2 at 2, as shown in this table. Uh, now, uh, however, the function value is not equal to 1, it's equal to 2 at 2. However, we have an uh, ordinary limit here. Let's look at 3. As I approach 3 from the left-hand side, uh, the limit is 2 and the function value is 2. When I approach 3 from the right-hand side, again the limit is 2 and the function value is there. So at this point, we have again an ordinary limit because right hand and left hand limits are uh, the same and it's equal to the value of the function. Now let's look at 4. As I approach 4, the limit is 1 from the left hand side. I cannot approach 4 from the right hand side because uh, the function is not defined. So at 4, uh, you don't have right-hand limit, but you have left-hand limit, which is equal to 1, and function value is 1 half. So uh, the right-hand and left-hand limits, especially in piecewise defined function, become very important. So that's the rigorous now, that's the rigorous definition of uh, one-sided limits. 
Let's assume that the domain of F contains an interval, uh, open interval CD. C is not included here. D is not included on this side. So it's in the domain. So the function is defined in this interval. We say that f of x has right hand limit at c and right limit as x approaches to c plus of f of x is l. Now, if for every epsilon, every epsilon, every greater than zero epsilon, there exists a corresponding number delta greater than zero. So in this interval, uh, for all x in this interval, f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So in order to prove that there is a right hand limit for a function, you have to find for every given epsilon, you have to find a delta. So in this interval, for all x in this interval, f of x minus l is less than epsilon. There is a similar definition for left hand limit. Suppose the domain F contains an interval BC. C is not included here. B is not included. That's an open interval to the left of C. We say that F has left hand limit L at C and right F of X. As X approaches to C minus of F of X is equal to L. If for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero such that for all x in this interval, this is true. So you have to show me that there exists delta for given epsilon. So that's similar to the definition of uh, ordinary limit. In the ordinary limit, we, were, we are trying to find a symmetric interval around C. Here, where we uh, are trying to find a right-hand interval to the right of C, and here we are trying to find left-hand intervals uh, before C. So the definitions, I mean, the rigorous definition of uh, one-sided limits and limits are very similar. That's a pictorial representation Suppose you are given an epsilon, and that's your limit. Uh, that's L plus epsilon, and that's L minus epsilon. You have choose an interval to the right of C, okay? So that in this interval, for all x in this interval, your function value must lie between L plus epsilon and L minus epsilon. That's what happening for one-sided limits. Now that's another pictorial representation. Uh, now again, you are given an epsilon. This is L plus epsilon. This is your L, the limit. This is L minus epsilon. So you have to choose an interval to the left of C so that for all x in this interval, your function value must lie within these limits. That's L plus E and L minus E. Then you're all done. You can, and uh, then you prove that there is a left hand limit. Now let's look at this picture, this uh, figure. Our function is square root of X. And uh, we are going to check the limit as X approaches to zero. It can be seen as here as x approaches zero from the right hand side, the limit is zero. So square root of x minus zero absolute value less than epsilon. Actually, we don't have to put the absolute value here because uh, square root of x is a positive number. That's equal to saying that x is less than epsilon squared. Because uh, when you take the square of square root of x, it's x, and the square of this is epsilon. So the delta that I'm going to choose here must be epsilon square. Because if x is less than epsilon square, that means uh, x values are here, 
and y values are here, and square root of x less than epsilon. Uh, so that was a simple example of what we mean by that. If you look at this function, uh, that's y is equal to sine 1 over x. As you approach 0, either from the right and from the left, the function oscillates too much. So you can put a limit on this function because of high frequency, because of oscillation too much. This function does not have right-hand limit, neither left-hand limit, and of course, obviously, does not have a limit at x equal to 0. You cannot put a limit. Because for every real number L, I can find an interval delta. Uh, and in this interval, x exceeds L and becomes less than L. So there is no uh, limit for this function. Now let's look at sine theta over theta. That's the graph of sine theta over theta. But at zero, this function is not defined because sine theta is zero, at zero, theta zero, and this is zero. So there is an open dot here uh, telling us that zero is not included in the domain of this function. Now, if I approach from the right to zero, it seems that the limit is one. Or when I approach limit uh, zero from the left hand side, it's again equal to 1. So we can maybe prove that this function actually has a limit 1, ordinary limit, at theta equal to 0. Now, for this reason, we are going to use a sandwich theorem. Now, that's quarter of a circle with radius 1 there. Now, let's look at uh, the triangle OAP. The height of the triangle is sine theta uh, because this distance is sine theta since the radius is one here. And this distance is red is cosine theta. Okay, now OAP, what's the area of the OAP triangle? So it is equal to the height is uh, sine theta base is 1, and so is equal to 1 over 2 sine theta is the area of this triangle. Now let's look at this sector, area sector, uh, covered by uh, the circle. Okay? So uh, the area of this sector here is equal to 1 over 2 r squared. Actually, r is equal to 1, r squared times theta, sorry. Since r is equal to 1, that's equal to 1 over, th 1 over 2 theta. Because if theta was 2 pi, you will get pi r squared, which is the area of the circle. So the theta gives you 1 over 2 r squared gives the times theta, gives you the area of the sector. And it's obvious that this area is greater than the area of the triangle or AP. That's greater, obviously. Now let's look at this triangle, OAT. Okay. That's a right triangle. And this length is 1. This length is tangent theta. So uh, the area of this triangle is greater than both, that's equal to 1 over 2 tangent theta, because the height is tangent theta, base is 1. So there is this inequality between the areas of two triangles and one area sector. Now, I can cancel out two from each uh, side. Sine theta is less than theta, which is less than tangent theta. That's what I get. Now I can divide everything by sine theta. Okay, so here I have 1, theta over sine theta, and 1 over cosine theta. This equality holds, and it directly comes from the fact that uh, this triangle has area 
larger than the area sector of the circle, which is larger than the area of OPA or OAP triangle. Okay, so we can write from here if you take the reciprocal, okay, sine theta over theta is greater than cosine theta. We are taking the reciprocal of uh, the two, and which is great, uh, less than one, which is greater than one, sorry. Uh, so now, what happens is theta approaches zero from, uh, from the right-hand side, right here. And, of course, because of the sandwich theorem, theta zero means that the cosine theta is one. So there is one here, and this is a constant function, so there is one here. And so sine theta over theta must be equal to one as theta approaches zero. Okay, so that's the proof by using a sandwich theorem that sine theta over theta is equal to one as theta goes to zero because it can be proved from the both uh, sides, either from the left or from the right. Now, use, yeah, let's use this result, which is uh, important uh, because sine theta over theta is not defined at theta equal to zero, but it has an ordinary limit at theta equal to zero. So we can use this result to prove that cosine h minus one divided by h as h goes to zero is zero. Because when you put h zero here, this is one, this is minus one, and that's zero, zero divided by zero is not a real number. So the ordinary limit is not obvious here. But now I can write cosine h minus one over h as follows, minus two sine square h over two divided by h. This really comes from half angle formula uh, for for sine, uh, for sine of uh, theta. So it's minus 2 sine square h over 2 divided by h. I can write this as follows. I can take 2 under h, so sine h over 2 over h times sine h over 2. So one of them I separate it like this. Now, I know that this has a limit. Because when h approaches to zero, uh, both approaches to zero, so theta, sine theta over theta I can use here. So I get minus one from this part. Now this has a limit, sine h over two, as limit goes to, as h goes to zero, is zero. So minus one times uh, zero gives me zero. Uh, that's the multiplicative proof for the limits. Okay. So uh, that's a proof that cosine h minus 1 divided by h is 0. Now let's prove that sine 2x over 5x is 2 over 5. So limit as, uh, as x goes to 0. So limit as x goes to 0, sine 2x over 5x. Uh, multiply and divide this number by 2 over 5 what we do here. Now, since this is a constant, I can take out. So 2 over 5, and 5 is cancel out here. I have 2x here. So that's sine theta over theta form again. And I know that this limit is 1. So the limit of this is 2 over 5. So that's how you use uh, the limit of sine theta over theta. Now let's look at continuity after the limits. Continuity uh, uh, is based on the limits. The definition of continuity directly comes from the limit. Okay, let's see the real number that is either an interior point or an end point of an interval in the domain of f. 
Okay, so uh, now the function is continuous at C if limit as X approaches to C of F of X is F of C. So we know that the function is defined uh, over an interval which contains C. So the function has a value at C. And it's, uh, we say that the function is continuous at C if it, the limit exists and it's equal to F of C. So that's the basic definition of continuity. Now, if this function is over a closed interval uh, with endpoints, suppose uh, left endpoint is C, then F is said to be right continuous at C or continuous from the left if there is a one sided limit of F of X as X approaches to C plus and it is equal to F of C again. So in this case, we say that the function is right continuous. Now, similarly, function is said to be left continuous if X approaches to C minus. That's from the left-hand side. The limit exists, and it's equal to f of c. Okay. At the end points, we might not have um, two-sided uh, limits, but we might have one-sided limits. And if that limit is equal to the value of the function at that point, well, we say it's left continuous and right continuous. Okay. So. That's the basic definition of continuity. So any function, when we say it is continuous, it must obey these rules. Now let's look at this function. That's important. Uh, now when I approach, this function is defined on a closed interval, uh, 0, 4. So that's the left hand point. Now, when I approach zero from the right hand side, the limit exists and it is equal to one. So it is right continuous at point zero. This function is right continuous. Now, when I approach one uh, from the left hand side, the limit exists and it is zero, but it's not equal to the value of the function. So at one, the function is not left continuous because the value of the limit is different when you approach from the left. Now, when you approach from the right, the limit is one and the function value is one. So at this point, this function is right continuous. Let's look at point two. Now, when I approach two from the left hand side, the limit is equal to one. When I approach from the right hand side, the limit is again one. So this function has ordinary limit at two, but the function value is not, e uh, is not equal to one. It's different from the limit, it's equal to two. So this point is not continuous. At this point, the limit exists, but the function value is not equal to the limit. Now, when you approach uh, three from the left hand side, the limit is two. When you approach three from the right hand side, the limit is two again, and the function value is two. So at three, the function is continuous. Uh, so, because everything is satisfied, the limit exists, it's a two sided limit and it's equal to the value of the function. Now, when I approach from the left-hand side to four, uh, the limit exists and it is equal to one. But the function value is one over two. So at four, the, the, this function is not left continuous. It is not, it cannot be right continuous because the function value is not defined for values of X greater than four. So that's a summary of the usage of right hand, left hand limits and ordinary limits and how they are connected to continuity.
Okay, that's a pictorial representation overall of an ordinary function. It's continuous in the closed interval because if you take any interior point C, take an approach from the right and left, there is a limit, and actually the value of the function is the limit also. So if you approach A from the right hand side, there exists a limit and it's equal to the value of the function. So if you approach B from the left hand side, there is a limit and it's equal to the value of the function. So this function is said to be continuous over this integral. We know that it's right continuous here and left continuous here, but that's the only thing we can have at the end points. So this function is said to be continuous over the closed interval AB. So if you summarize, we check interior points. Interior points must have ordinary limits and it must be equal to the value of the function at that point. And points here at the left end point, you must have right continuity. And in the right hand uh, point B, you must have left. Continuity. And we say this function is continuous over the closed interval AB. Let's look at this function again. We have that before, but let's look at it in terms of continuity. Now, this function is defined everywhere for all interior points, and there exists a limit for all interior points. And the limit is equal to value of the function at that point. Now, let's look at the uh, endpoints. As I approach from, uh, uh, as I approach minus two from the right hand side, this function has a limit zero and it's equal to the value of the function at that point. So we have right continue to here. Now, if I approach two from the left hand side, there exists a limit, which is zero, and the value of the function is zero. So we are right continuous here, left continuous here, continuous over the all interior points, and that means this function is continuous uh, over the closed interval minus two and plus two. Okay, let's look at this function that's called the unit step function. And y is equal to 1 if x is greater than or equal to 0. So here, this branch. And y is equal to 0 if x is less than 0. Here is this branch. Let's check the continuity at 0. Now, when I approach uh, 0 from the left hand side, the limit is 0. When I approach zero from the right hand side, the limit is one. So it's not left continuous. This function is not left continuous. It is only right continuous. So it's not continuous at this point zero. That's an interior point. Only the right hand limit exists and it's equal to the value of the function. So we have right continuity. Uh, but well, we don't have that continuity. So this function is not continuous at point zero. So the continuity test to tell again, the function f of is, is continuous at a point xc. If one only if it meets the following three conditions, as we said, f of c must exist definitely, whether C is an interior point or end point, doesn't make a difference. F of C must exist. And the limit of F of X as X approaches 2 must exist. And this limit must be equal to uh, F of C. At the end points, it should be on the left hand point, it should be right continuous. Uh, in the right hand uh, end point, it should be left continuous. So that, well, that's when we say uh, the function is continuous. So that's a summary of what we have said before. Let's look at the greatest integer function. And now, if you look at this piece, 
as you approach zero from the right hand side, the limit is zero and the function value is zero. It's always, uh, it's right continuous here. The same is true for one and for two and for three. But if you approach one from the left hand side, the limit exists, it's zero, but the function value is one. So it's not left continuous. So this greatest integer function is continuous every non-integer point that's between these two, and it is right continuous at every integer point. So this function is right continuous for every integer point, uh, but uh, it's right continuous only. It's not left continuous at the integers. Now, suppose we have this function, y is equal to x plus 1, or x greater than 0, y is equal to x plus 1 if x, and less, if x is less than 0. But this function is not defined at 0. So it's discontinuous at 0. However, the function is continuous throughout its domain, because its domain does not include 0. In this domain, it is continuous. Uh, because as you approach x from uh, x zero from uh, right hand side, the limit is one. If you approach from the left hand side, the limit is one, and it's equal to the value of the function. So it's continuous throughout its domain, and it's done. It is continuous at x zero. Now, if I put uh, a value at x0 as equal to 1, and there is con uh, uh, 0 is included in the domain because the function has a value at x equal to 0, which is equal to 1. Actually, uh, it's equal to the value of the function. So this function, uh, the difference, it is continuous at x equal to 0, so continuous throughout its domain. Now, uh, if I put 2 at x equal to 0, what happens? Now, of course, the limit exists as you approach x from uh, right-hand side or left-hand side, uh, and the limit is equal to 1. But the function value is not equal to 1. It's equal to 2. Now, this we call a renewable jump discontinuity at x sub 0. x sub 0 is included in the domain of the function because it has a value at x equal to 0 as 2, but uh, it's not equal to the limit. This is called removable jump discontinuity. How do we remove it? By putting x through a value which is equal to the limit at x equal. Okay, so let's look at this function. Y is equal to 1 over x squared. Now, there is no limit as x approaches to 0, either from the right or from the left. There is no limit because the function grows too much. So this function has infinite discontinuity at x equal to 0. It's not removable. Similarly, y is equal to sine 2 pi over x. This function has oscillated wildly as x approaches to 0, so it has an oscillating discontinuity at x equal to 0. We can look at uh, the picture, pictorial representation. Okay, this is function has is continuous at x equal to 0 because there is a limit, and the limit is equal to the value of function. This is not continuous at x of 0, because the function is not defined at x equal to 0. It has a limit, ordinary limit, but it's not equal to the value of function. Actually, the, uh, 0 is not in the domain of function, so this is discontinuous at 0. Now, when I put 2 at x equal to 0, the same function, Again, this function is discontinuous at x equal to 0. 
because the limit exists and it's equal to one ordinary limit the function value is two okay so this is discontinuous at uh, zero also but this one is removed discontinuous if i move this point to one and we'll have this picture and the continuous uh, take include equal to zero this function as we have seen before it is right continuous only at x equal to zero it's not left continuous because the limit exists when you approach from the left but the function value is one so this has uh, not continuous at x zero okay uh, now this is a one over x squared that's the figure as you approach zero from the right or from the left uh, the function grows too much uh, so uh, it has infinite discontinuity and this has as we said sine one over x oscillating discontinuity okay let's continue that's y is equal to one over x okay this is not continuous at x equal to zero but however the domain is not included in uh, and zero is not included in the domain so this function except zero has a limit everywhere as you can see and limit equal to the value of the function so it's continuous throughout its domain natural domain this function is continuous in its domain but if the domain includes zero there's a discontinuity there okay that's uh, the rules properties of continuous function if you have two functions f and g which are continuous at x equal to c then f plus g is continuous f minus g is continuous uh, f multiplied with a constant k is continuous f times g is continuous f over g is continuous of course g of c must not be zero and powers are continuous positive powers and the roots uh, are continuous of course the expression the number in the root uh, must be zero for n is equal to two or n is equal to four okay so these are very similar to the rules of limits because the continuity is based on these limits okay uh, composite functions composition of continuous functions now, if f is continuous at c and g is continuous f of c, and the composition is continuous. This is sort of a pictorial representation of what is happening. f is continuous at c there. So it maps c to f of c. And now g is continuous f of c. So this red line, uh, red arrow, says that g of f of x is continuous at c polynomials and rational functions are continuous in generally continuous throughout domain okay so sine of x and cosine x are continuous everywhere six trigonometric functions are continuous throughout their domain for instance tangent theta uh, between pi over 2 and minus pi over 2 is continuous at exactly pi over 2 it's not continuous but pi over 2 minus pi over 2 are not included in the domain and so these are uh, the domain of they continue like this and like this here that's the whole domain of tangent x. Okay, let's give an example for another composite function. Let's consider y is equal to square root of x squared minus x minus 6. 
Well, I write f of x is x squared minus x minus 6, which is continuous everywhere. Now, g of x, let's consider g of x as square root of x. So, g of f of x is this function. Now, what's the domain of this function? Let's look at this first. You can factorize x squared minus x minus 6 as x plus 2 and x minus 3. Okay, so uh, the square root is not defined for negative numbers. So the domain of this function minus infinity minus 2. Minus 2 is included because at minus 2, this is 0. Between minus infinity and minus 2, uh, this is uh, positive, negative, this is negative, so the, whole, the multiplication is positive, so the function is defined here. Between 3 and uh, infinity also, when x is 3, at greater than or equal to 3, equal to 3 is included, uh, that's, the, uh, the, uh, that's the interval, semi-infinite interval, where the function is undefined. So the domain of this function is here. Now between minus two and three, it's not, uh, uh, minus two and three is not included in the domain because this is a negative number. So it's continuous throughout its domain, uh, in this domain, uh, and, uh, that's what we can conclude. These are some examples of continuity. Now here, there's no problem in the denominator. Okay? This function is defined everywhere. Sine x is continuous everywhere. Y is equal to x continuous everywhere. One plus x squared divided by one plus x squared. So this is continuous throughout this domain. Now, if you will look at this rational, function absolute value of x minus 2 uh, divided by x squared minus 2. So that's a composite function again. f of x is x minus 2 over x squared minus 2. g of x is absolute value function, so g of f of x is this function. Now the domain of this function is minus infinity minus square root of 2 because uh, the, these are the points where the denominator is zero, but the numerator is not zero. So minus infinity minus square root of two, and then it's continuous minus square root of two plus square root of two in an open interval, uh, because uh, denominator not zero here in this open interval, it has a value, and then it's continuous uh, in this interval too square root of 2 uh, and infinity, plus infinity. So it's continuous throughout its domain. That's an example for composite function. And this is x sine x divided by x square over 2. As you can see, it's continuous everywhere. OK, that theorem also summarizes uh, for the limits of continuous function, composite functions. Now, continuous extension joint. Now, let's look at sine x over x. We know that this function has a limit as x goes to 0 from both ends side. It's not defined for x equal to 0, but if I do this, I'll sine x over x. Uh, if x is not 0, it's equal to 1 if x is 0. And that's continuous extension to a point. This function in the domain of function does not include uh, 0. But here we put a value at 0. And the value of the function is equal to the value of the limit of sine x over x as x goes to 0. So it's continuous everywhere now. So, that's called the continuous extension to a point. No point where the function is not defined. We put uh, as a value uh, the limit of the function. 
and that's continuous extension. Now let's look at this. We have seen before, if you factorize both the numerator and denominator, you can see that at uh, x minus 2, you can cancel out if x is not equal to 2. So if x is not equal to 2, that's x plus 3 over x plus 2. And if you substitute here 5 over 4, now the limit is this function as x approaches to 2 from both, uh, uh, both sides is equal to 5 over 4. Now, however, uh, it's not defined at x equal to 2. So what I can do is, I can write this as follows. y is equal to x squared plus x minus 6 divided by x squared minus 4 if x is not equal to 2. However, at x equal to 2, it's equal to 5 over 4, which is the limit of this function. So it's continuous everywhere now. However, not everywhere, because at minus 2, it has infinite discontinuity. Because at x minus 2, uh, this uh, denominator is 0 here. However, the numerator is not 0. So it has infinite discontinuity at x equal to minus 2. OK. However, uh, minus 2 is in, not included in the domain of this function because it has infinite discontinuity that it cannot be included. It continues throughout its domain. Okay, so that's a pictorial representation of sine x over x. So here, originally, the function is not defined here. It has a limit one, it's not defined at uh, zero. So now after we put at zero, x is equal, uh, function is equal to one, and if you put the point here, now it's continuous at x equal to zero. So that's continuous extension to a point from here to here. But you have to define the value of the function at zero as equal to one. Otherwise, it won't be uh, continuous. If you put a 2, it's discontinuous again. So that's why we say if you put the limit as the value of the function at that point, then you have continuous extension to a point. That's another pictorial representation of x squared plus x minus 6 divided by x squared minus 4 at 2. Uh, this function is continuous, but however, you can uh, not continuous. However, you can do continuous expansion, extension, x plus three or x plus four after canceling x minus two. So the limit of this function and this function are the same. But now the only difference is that the function, this function, is not defined at x equal to two. This function is defined x equal to 2, and its limit is equal to its function's value, so it is now continuous at this point. At minus 2, of course, it has the infinite discontinuity. So that was the uh, pictorial representation of what happens in this function. Let's look at a famous theorem, which is called the Intermediate Value Theorem for Continuous Functions. Now, let's say uh, f of x is continuous in a closed interval, a, b. So it's right continuous at a, left continuous at b, and uh, continuous everywhere in between these values. So the Intermediate Value Theorem says that if f is a continuous function on a closed interval a, b, and if y sub 0 is any value between f of a and f of b, so between f of a and f of b and f of a, y 0 is. So there is, uh, is any value between f of a and f of b, 
and y through is equal to f of c for some c in AB. That's a pictorial representation of intermediate value theorem. So, but the function has to be continuous uh, for this to be true. For any value between fa and f of b, let's say y sub zero, you have a point where the function value is equal to y sub zero. That's what it means. Uh, let's look at this function. It's not continuous at two. And I can uh, put y sub zero to and a half here. And the function does not have this value anywhere. So intermediate value does not apply because this function has jumped up this continuity at x equal to 2. So that's the, that shows the importance of continuity or intermediate value theorem. OK, there are other applications of intermediate value theorem. Let's look at this function, f of x, the graph of f of x is here. x cubed minus x minus 1 is equal to 0. I want to find the roots of this polynomial. I look at f of 0, it's equal to minus 1. I look at f of 1.5, 0, 8, 7, 5. And this is negative, this is positive in this interval. So I conclude that there must be an x here where the function is zero, okay? Because let's say this is f of a and this is f of b, then between f of a and f of b, there is zero. So this function must cross the x-axis at some point, uh, and now you can squeeze this interval like this and squeeze more. Uh, here the function is negative, here it's positive in this interval. There must be a point where it crosses the x-axis, where the function value uh, is zero. Same here, you can squeeze more. And uh, when you try to find roots of a function, that's uh, very convenient, because you don't uh, have to search all uh, real numbers. You just look at a small interval. Okay, let's stop at uh, section 2.6, which is limits involving infinity and asymptotes of graphs. Uh, we will cover this uh, in uh, recording three. So let's uh, stop for the time being.